second support and information workshop as we've sort of branded it um, and it's part of a series that we are bringing you to your own homes um, kind of as a substitution to what you sadly would have seen um, at one of our two conferences this year that have unfortunately had to be cancelled because of the COVID outbreak um, and all of the restrictions that are now in place. Um, so we thought it would be a really good idea for you to still hear about some of the information and the fantastic speakers that we had lined up in your own homes. Um, so today we're really excited to bring you a talk from MOVE, which is a charity founded by Gemma, who you'll hear much more oh, about. So you can see it. Um, and Hi. it's... Hi guys. <laughs> Really, it's a charity um, to support and inspire people to move again after cancer. Um, and I'll let Gemma go into it in much more detail. Um, we thought it was important to mention that Gemma has had a diagnosis of cancer herself, um, but also comes from a sports science background and is a trained cancer rehab specialist. And, you know, it's safe to say you're very passionate, aren't you, Gemma, about yeah. the sort of benefits of exercise and movement and you know, the psychological impact that it can have on being active after cancer treatment. Um, so I'll just hand over to Jo, who just gives you a few housekeeping things. Yeah, I think as Louise said, if you can just keep your um, microphone on mute while Gemma's speaking, just to cut down on any background noise. Um, we're also going to record this session, if that's okay with everybody, because we would like to upload it to the BCRT YouTube channel so people who couldn't make the session today can watch it at their own leisure. And also you can go back and watch it if you'd like to do that. Um, so if you don't want to be videoed, if you just put your, your camera on, uh, sorry, turn your camera off, that'd be great. Um, I think that's it, housekeeping wise. So yeah, if I can yeah. hand you over yeah. to Gemma now, that'd be lovely. Brilliant, thanks guys and thank you for the lovely introduction um, and thank you to everybody for coming on. Um, so I wasn't just going to speak to myself, it's nice to see a lot of people on here, um, which is awesome. So I have actually got some slides to share with you today, but before I get started with that, I just wanted to give you a brief introduction of what I'm actually going to talk about today. And I know that a lot of you will be on here from different backgrounds, personal experience with cancer. Some of you will have had cancer yourself. Um, some of you will be healthcare professionals. So really it's a wide audience. And, and I just wanna say that the presentation isn't designed specifically for one person's diagnosis or your current health status or your goals and needs. But hopefully today what it will do is provide some inspiration and some food for thought around the topic of exercise and cancer. And what that's really important is it will trigger conversations and questions that you might have that then we can go on and help you after this session as well by either referring to some other support groups, answering your questions, um, or, and also you know, providing um, specific guidance in the future for you guys. And we've also spoke about maybe coming on again and doing more of a specific session around those questions. So lots of things that we can talk about and lots of things that we can cover, which is really exciting. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today is actually um, how movement, physical activity and exercise can help you live a better life when living with and beyond cancer. So we're not just looking at somebody who's had their treatment years ago and are now living a life beyond cancer. We're also now in the space looking at people living with cancer. And I think that's really, really important to remember. Um, but also um, there's a lot of research now around exercise and cancer and its benefits. And I'm gonna talk about that today, but we're actually looking at moving towards exercise as medicine. So yes, it does not absolutely replace treatment. Absolutely not. It's not a, you know, an alternative treatment method, but it absolutely does and should sit alongside that treatment for cancer um, at the right time and in the right place. Um, and actually what we're looking at now from the evidence is that you know, traditional methods um, of telling people to rest and always rest and sit still aren't actually the most effective, okay? So now it's actually, um, the evidence shows that it's safer to keep or move or start moving when you can. So I look at it as sitting less and moving more um, when you're going through your treatment and beyond, okay? So I'm gonna go really into detail about those different areas and then provide some um, information around, some more information around where you can look to find um, support as well. 
So hopefully that's okay. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to share my screen to get us started here. So hopefully you guys can see that. If you want to see it bigger as well, you can pin your screen. So in the little right, the three dots in the right hand corner of your, um, your kind of um, video box. And you can actually pin your screen so that you can just see what I'm doing, hopefully. <laughs> so um, I'm going to get started. So we are a charity um, that support people to move against cancer. And I wanted to start off with this, um, this quote being the best project you will ever work on is you. And I think that this is just super, super important because it's basically um, talking about, you know, often in our lives, we don't put ourselves first. So regardless of what cancer or what's gone on in your life, um, I love coming back to this quote because actually what we do need to look at is actually we are the best projects we've ever, we'll ever work on. And we all know probably how important our health is. And it's important, even with a cancer diagnosis, when living with and beyond cancer. And I think we should never really forget that. And we should look at ways that we can help make our quality of life better. We can, um, you know, be able to move a little bit more and help our mental and physical health in order to, you know, live a, be live a better life. Um, so this is me. And I wanted to tell you just a little bit about my story. And the reason being is because I've been, I've had cancer. Um, so I was diagnosed at the age of 24 in 2012. So eight years ago now. Um, and, you know, it was eight years ago, actually, on the 3rd of July. So I have felt what it felt like to go through cancer treatment. So my main type of treatment was chemotherapy. I was diagnosed with stage three Burkitt's lymphoma, which was quite an aggressive form of cancer. I spent a lot of time in hospital. I had short term and I had long term side effects of treatment. Um, but for me, the reason why I set up the charity was because physical activity and movement underpinned my journey with cancer. Um, so luckily, I'd come from quite a sporty background before I was diagnosed with cancer. But, but now I've worked with a lot of people who, you know, don't have those foundations or don't have positive relationships with exercise and movement and actually found it really difficult to get moving um, during any part of their lives. But what I recognized during my cancer journey was that exercise um, gave me a form of control. So my whole life was spinning out of my control. I didn't have control of my treatment. I didn't have control of where I went hospital stays. I didn't have control of, you know, um, what, you know, my diagnosis, all of that sort of stuff. But going out for a run for me personally gave me a form of control and it gave me a form of normality. Not only did it help me physically, it also helped me extremely mentally um, because I was just able to switch back, switch away from this whole world that, cancer was defining me and you know I was more than cancer I was also myself and I was also able to run and that you know that gave me something positive um, to look forward to now there's the reality of this as well I went through eight months of cancer treatment and I wasn't able to you know there's weeks where I literally couldn't get out of bed I couldn't move um, I was really really poorly um, so I could so I only tried to move and do things when I could but basically um, what happened was I went through nine, 10 months of treatment. And when I was moving away from my cancer treatment, so going into remission and to where I am now, the power of exercise and um, physical activity and movement became more apparent to me. My life got back on track a little bit quicker. I felt healthier. My quality of life improved. My mental and physical ability improved. And my mental state was a lot better than it was when I was diagnosed with cancer. So I really, really understood and experienced the power of physical activity and exercise. And I think that's now why, with all the research in place, that they're looking at it as saying exercise is medicine. You know, if we could put exercise as a pill and take it, every single person in this country or in the world would be taking it. The reason why we don't, a lot of people don't do it is one, the understanding and the education around what's important and what can I do and what can't I do. So it's kind of permissions. Two, it's, it's not easy. <laughs> it's hard to move initially, okay? It's hard to just take that first step and get started. And then the third is actually a lot of mental um, and mindset issues around exercise. So confidence levels, you know, barriers, self-esteem, um, not knowing what to do. We all have these conflicting thoughts that go around in our head that prevent us from taking the next step. 
Um, so hopefully what I'm going to do today is to provide you with an insight of why it's now pretty important to exercise and living with and beyond cancer, the evidence behind that, and then what you can do about it. Okay, hopefully everyone's following me, not having too many questions. I could talk for hours, me. <laughs> so you, we probably need to just do a whole episode of my story. <laughs> um, but I'm just giving you a snapshot there. Okay. So just to give you a little bit of background around us as a charity. So I set up the charity after my own experience. And one of the reasons why was that I wanted to make sure people got the support around exercise and cancer. Then it was the support that I didn't get. Okay. So I was told by one of my consultants that I wouldn't be even running or doing any exercise a year post keep finishing chemotherapy. Okay, so a year post finishing chemotherapy. And I, and I knew he didn't really, you know, he said the reason why was because somebody else who had the same cancer as me, that was their journey. And as we all know, you may have the same cancer diagnosis as somebody else, but there is a lot of different factors that influence, you know, how you feel, how you respond to things, your treatment, where you are, where your health status is. So no one person is the same in a cancer journey. And so I was adamant at the age of 24 that I wanted to provide people with the support that I never received. And that was support around exercising with their cancer diagnosis. So what I created, and we've evolved since we started um, in 2016, but what I created was an online cancer rehab program for children and young people. Okay, so up to the age of 30, I want, because I was a young person when I was diagnosed, we wanted to provide one-to-one -one support. So that basically looked at their individual health status, their diagnosis, their current goals and their current needs. And we worked with them to build their foundation, so build that strength, build that confidence and build that fitness so then they could go on and do anything else that they wanted to do. And we're still working to evolve this program in the long run. Uh, we're still a very small charity, but for um, you know, any age and um, any cancer diagnosis. But recently, two years ago, some of you may or may not know, we founded an initiative called 5K Your Way Move Against Cancer. And that's a you know, a pretty unstructured initiative that's linked to Park Run. And I'm gonna go more into that um, in the, in, later on in my presentation when I talk about what support you can access. Um, but that's the support group with a difference for anybody, any ability, any age, um, anybody who's been living with and beyond cancer and also healthcare professionals and family and friends. So, and fantastic initiative for you guys to get involved in. But what we also do, and it's like we're doing today, so what I do a lot of is talks and presentations. I've done them for a lot of other charities, Lymphoma Association, Teenage Cancer Trust, Shine, around raising awareness around the benefits of cancer and exercise and working with other charities and organizations. So hopefully that now you know that I'm not just a random person coming on saying exercise is amazing, let's all do it. <laughs> I actually have some experience, some, well, very, a lot of experience and, and a detailed background around that. So hopefully everybody's fine with that. Good. Okay. So let's look at the big picture around exercise and cancer. Um, so a lot of, so this really kicked off. There's been a lot of research for quite a while now going on in the background around the benefits of exercise and cancer. And there's still research going into tumor growth and the impact of exercise around that. So that's the more specific in terms of exercise as a, as a way of treatment. But actually, um, what we're looking at at the moment is, you know, the Clinical Oncology Society of Australia, there's an article in The Guardian um, not that long ago, and they spoke about exercise actually being, it's safer to exercise when you're going through your treatment um, and also beyond cancer than it is not to do anything at all. So actually move, you know, we are designed as human beings to move. So the less we move, the actual um, effect of that, even if we are going through our cancer treatment, can actually be more dangerous to us. And it's, you know, it's safer to actually start moving a little bit more. Now, for anybody who's been through cancer treatment, you'll know personally, there are times when you cannot move. And I think it's really, really important to also be aware and say, that's okay. You know, I spent two or three weeks not being able to get out of bed, being exhausted, and that's okay. But what we've got to try and focus on is exercise becoming the norm in cancer treatment and for people to focus on moving when they can move, which doesn't necessarily mean all the time, but also moving when it's right for you. So let me give you an insight into the bigger picture, okay? So... The current evidence base shows that there is now persuasive evidence that a healthy lifestyle during after cancer is associated with improved physical and psychological well-being. 
reduced risks of treatment, enhance self-esteem, reduce risk of recurrence, and improve survival. So that's come from the Na National Cancer Survivorship Initiative in 2013. Now we're in 2020 and this evidence base is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So really it points the, you know, the finger at this is an area of work that as a cancer services across the UK and across the world, we need to be working towards and we need to be talking about exercise um, as a form of medicine and a form of helping people to, to live better lives when living with and beyond cancer. So it's really, really important to recognise what does it actually feel to be, to be living with and beyond cancer. So treatment, and we, we spoke about this um, a while ago, I spoke about it to Louise quite a lot, in terms of the long-term impact of treatment can be really, really tough. Okay, so it can, you know, the treatment that you go through, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, surgeries, um, stem cell transplants, can really have um, a massive effect on the body in the long term. So, so you can see elements of fatigue, loss of physical strength. Okay, so you have long-term stays in hospital or you're sit sitting in bed for most of your treatment or you haven't really got back into exercise. You're spending a lot of time sitting. And when you sit a lot, your muscles don't care what's going on in your life at that point in time. They just get weaker and weaker and weaker and to be at, to a point where they're unable to support the structures of your body so that you can't even do necessarily functional movements okay so we're not talking about here going out and playing sport we're actually talking about functional everyday movements that we want to try and help people to achieve um, so you can experience um, depression and anxiety or post-traumatic stress from a you know your experience going through treatment um, dealing with the physical changes to the body. So a bone implant or a prosthe prosthes yeah, prosthesis. <laughs> I always get that word, um, never get it out of my mouth very well. Um, and surgeries, you know, can, can leave complications and long lasting effects. So weight loss or weight gain, body image issues, pain, nerve damage, reduced bone density, swelling, hot flushes and night sweats. So I could literally, the list could go on and on. So you are dealing with a lot and you know there's a lot of things going on in your life that make it very very difficult to see um, how you can get out of these or reduce some of these side effects of treatments so what the evidence shows that the benefits of exercise for cancer patients are and these aren't limited to these but what it shows is it actually if we start working towards the recommended amount of exercise which i'll go through um, with you shortly but if we actually start working towards that we're looking at a decreased rate of cancer progression. And this is from the evidence and studies that they've done over the years. Improved quality of life. Now that is really, really important. We all want to live a better life and we all can live a better life. And exercise and movement and physical activity can help to do that. So reducing the side effects and risks during treatment, but also the long-term side effects of treatment, okay? So really, really important to look at those long-term side effects of treatment that we really don't want to be struggling with 10, 15 years down the line, but many, many people do struggle with that. And, you know, exercise can be really great in reducing those um, side effects. One of the biggest things that happens when you've gone through cancer treatment is that cancer-related fatigue. And it can be absolutely, you know, it can really, really affect your life. And it can cause you to not want to go to social occasions, not want to do the things you want to do because you're tired all the time. Now, there's a difference between chronic fatigue and cancer-related fatigue, and healthcare professionals um, will help identify the two um, in terms of how that relates to you. But exercise is the number one intervention to help improve cancer-related so exercise actually helps to prevent loss of bone mineral density or developing osteoporosis so you're looking at actually the bone and the makeup of the skeleton and the human body actually has a really powerful effect on build, rebuilding bone density and stopping you from losing any more of it it also controls body weight and builds lean muscle so if you were like me, when I finished my treatment, I literally had Dr. Pepper. I wasn't given very good dietary device, um, advice. So every day I drank Dr. Pepper to get away the taste of the chemotherapy. And I pretty much ate chili heat wave Doritos every single day. Um, and so I think that, you know, there is a battle around um, nutrition and, and what, what things you're eating and actually comfort eating and, you know, eating to give yourself energy, but also eating the wrong things, which can have effects 
physically, but also food has a really knock on effect for mental health as well. So, you know, exercise really does help you to feel better, want to make healthier choices, but also builds, you know, controls that body weight and builds lean muscle, which essentially then help you to have a better quality of life. Um, so for some people, it eases symptoms of lymphedemia, it reduces the incidence of relapse, improves overall survival, but also just because we've had cancer doesn't mean we're immune to any other comorbidities, okay? So it does not mean just because you've had cancer that you're not going to get another type of cancer, cardiovascular or diabetes. You know, if you do not, the best, what you want to do is prepare your body as, and to look after it as well as you can so you reduce that risk massively of getting another comorbidity. Um, so I think there's a really important point on that side as well. Okay, is everyone following me? <laughs> Give me a thumbs yeah, up. Yeah. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Brill, okay, good. Um, I'd love to, we'll ask questions at the end, so hopefully um, everyone's following okay. So how do you actually get started? You know, I've told you, how great exercise can be and i've you know i've not gone into real detail i've kept it quite simple but how do we actually take the first step to even thinking about how it relates to our life and you know it's not easy to get started to exercise and it's not easy to be motivated either um, and we've all got completely different situations lifestyles um working situations not working situations that sort of thing so that all comes into the play in your mental state when you decide that this is something that you want to bring into your life so I think the best way to look at it is actually to understand your barriers and your motivators to wanting to move more. So you guys are obviously on here because you saw what the topic was and um, unless somebody convinced you otherwise, um, you saw what the topic was and felt, actually, I want to know more about this and I want to know more about how it can relate to my life. So what I would always say is actually being aware of how we feel is the first step. So some of people may have completely negative associations. And as soon as you hear the word exercise, you shiver and you're like, that's not me. I don't exercise. I've never done it and I don't want to do it. And that's okay. But what we want to try and change is we want to try, try and change your relationship with probably the word exercise. Because I think people just think going to the gym and doing all these weights and things like that. But actually how I reframe it is exercise is all about sitting less and moving more. That's that's what underpins it. So that might look like physical activity. So doing the gardening, walking a little bit more, sitting less, you know, um, taking a coffee break, getting up when you're watching TV, getting up, walking around for five minutes, sitting down. So you've got physical activity. You've got exercise, which might be a little bit more structured. You might go to the gym. You might go to, you know, not right now in the current um, environment, but you might have gone to a class, an exercise class, or you might play badminton with your friends or go for a walk, that sort of thing. And then sport is, you know, that sport where we're looking at football or netball or going for a run, that sort of thing. So you can really have a relationship with exercise in those three different areas. And really it's about what it, what it means to you. And I just think sitting less and moving more is a great way to describe it. Um, so let's have a look at the barriers to start off with. So why do people fear exercise or not actually want to take that first step to moving a little bit more? And these are realistic barriers. These are barriers that people living with and beyond cancer have shared with us as being quite common and being part of their thought process. So some of it can come down to lack of confidence, lack of motivation. So you don't really understand why you want to exercise. So there's no real motivation. Living with a disability, um, embarrassment, fear, bad weather, dislike of the gym or not the sporty type. Living with or what with one or more long term conditions so that could completely put you off because you don't think that I you know you don't think that you can exercise or that you should exercise. Lack of time, lack of local opportunity, lack of support is a big one, um, and actually being unsure of where to start. So we all have different barriers. Some of those may have related to you, some may not. But then what we want to do is actually look at our motivators. So what might motivate us to want to exercise and want to so have a better quality of life or live our best life when living with a beyond cancer? And that might be spending time with family and friends. So do you have you know, a little, nie uh, little niece or a little granddaughter or, that you want to run around after and you need a bit more energy to be able to do that? Um, or do you want to, you know, a motivator can be increased quality of life. I want to feel better. I want to be able to do more things. I want to have more energy. That, that can be a real big motivator. 
proving to yourself that you still can do something. So you may, you know, we talk about the new normal when living with and beyond cancer. And actually it's the first time I've heard it used outside the cancer setting is with COVID-19 and what we're going through now. Everybody's saying we're adjusting to a new normal. And I'd only really heard that when I was diagnosed with cancer. Um, but actually there are some things that you, you know, we may have done before we had cancer and we may not do now, but it might not be because we can't. It might just be because our lives have changed and we just don't think we can. So actually, can we prove to ourselves that we can still do things? Staying fit and healthy makes us feel better uh, mentally and physical. So giving yourself time for you, so setting yourself goals and giving yourself time to work on you so that, you know, the best project you'll ever work on is you is um, so important there. You want to feel better. You might feel socially isolated. So actually, how can you expand your social circle? Um, mental health benefits are, you know, huge motivators. Exercise is linked to improving mental health. Um, so there's a lot of evidence and research around exercise being one of the interventions um, and the, you know, to improve mental health. Um, so that's really important. Decreasing social isolation and also improving strength and fitness. So we, we kind of need to focus on those motivators to give us the motivation and the, you know, the um, inspiration to start thinking about exercise and how, where it has a place in our lives. Okay. So this is just a little tip, and I wasn't sure whether to put this in, but I wanted to put a little <coughs> tip in on actually looking at our mindset and our motivation. So we work with people um, around exercise and cancer and integrated it into their lives. And we work with a lot of people who have never really exercised before. And we use goal setting can be used in all sorts of areas of life. But this is a really simple form of goal setting. And I think goal setting can be a great way for you to become aware of where you are right now in your thought process and in your life. So do you do, for example, an exercise? Do you do no exercise? You've never had a, you've got a negative relationship with exercise. So you need to set a goal in order for you to take that first step um, to moving towards moving a little bit more. So what we want to look at here is what actually do you want to achieve? So the first thing would be, well, why did you come on this session today? Like, is there something that you think that you want to improve? So is it, do you want to, you know, increase your quality of life or do you want to build strength in um, some of, you know, your um, muscles or do you want to, um, you know, have a better positive mindset? So those are the sort of things that you can look at. And then what you want to look at is the outcome. So what, you know, what do you want, what do you want your life to look at? So look like um, if you actually did um, set the goal that you set, what do you want your life to look like? So what would be the outcome? So it'd be moving a little bit more, feeling better. So you've really got something that you can home in on um, that helps you to every day keep moving towards your goal. But one of the really important things is the obstacle. So again, identifying that obstacle and then coming up with a plan on how you're going to get around that. So one great thing is, okay, I don't have the time to exercise or I, you know, that's the, probably one of the biggest, one of the biggest barriers. So a plan would be actually, what am I going to do to overcome that obstacle? And it might be scheduling into your Google um, diary or your Google calendar at nine o'clock in the morning, I'm going to go out for a 10 minute run, um, 10 minute walk. That would be a plan to overcome that obstacle. So you can get really detailed on that plan or you can go a little bit broader and do, you know, um, once a week, once a month or have a yearly plan, depending on what's right for you. So that was just, I don't, I'm not going to go into too much detail because of time today, but I think that's something that we could perhaps go into in another session on individually. How can you set a goal, how can you overcome an obstacle and how can you set a plan um, that works towards that goal. So from this session, I've talked to you about the evidence um, around the benefits of cancer and exercise. I've talked to you about um, actually how does that relate to your life? What are the barriers? What are the motivators? How goal setting could be important to help you take that first step. But these are the, this is kind of a summary of what to actually think about. Um, so what people's perceptions are is that, okay, I'm going to start some exercise and I'm going to go do it five to seven days a week, every single day, um, for two hours a day. And that is not the way to start. Okay. That is not realistic. What you want to do. And I talk about this quite a lot is you want to build your foundation. So you need to start off small. 
And that might be going for a five minute walk once a week, okay? That is a realistic goal for somebody who hasn't been moving too much um, over the last six months, years, 10 years, okay? So what people often do is set really unrealistic goals. And actually what you wanna do is take a step back. And what I mean by building foundations is starting off slow and just building up gradually because your body needs to take time to adapt it, you know, if you go too hard too soon, it's just going to end up in disaster. But also, likely it is you need some more specific guidance and advice from somebody else, which we'll go into a minute, to help you build those foundations. Okay. Then what we want to look at is cardiovascular fitness. So general fitness around the heart and lung. So again, um, the, the heart and lung fitness is really important, as well as the muscle strength. We want to look at bits of flexibility training. And we want to look at balance and proprioception, okay? So these may sound really detailed, but actually to live, to improve our quality of life and to do functional everyday movements, you need a base level of these key areas to be able to do that. The more you sit, the more these areas will decrease and the likelihood is will impact on your quality of life. Um, and everything we've talked about in the knock-on effect of cancer treatment as well. So by actually um, increasing your movement levels, it will increase these areas that will have a positive knock-on effect on your quality of life, have a positive effect on the long-term effects of cancer and its treatments, relapse, um, all of those things I talked about before, and actually put you in a really, really good place. Okay? So what I would say is... I, I always understand that when I do presentations like this, it is very, it is not specific to you. So you'll be watching this thinking, this is great, this is amazing, but how do I make it a little bit specific to me? So some of us, so I, when I went through my treatment, I, I was lucky I came from a running background. I, I did sports science at university. So I was able to build myself up in terms of from zero of exercise or activity when I finished my treatment to being back running and racing and be, um, doing running competitions but I had a you know I had a sports science background I came from a running background very sporty background so I was you know I wasn't I was confident to do that I still could have had cancer rehab support but I'm also aware that many of you will be sat on here going that's all great but I wouldn't be confident enough to take the first step um, and we are very aware of that and that's why what we want to try and do is support you as much as we can in terms of where you can turn to and where you can go to but if you are looking at, so this is a top tip, if you are already a little, quite confident and you're saying, actually, you know, I just need to kick up the bum <laughs> to actually move a little bit more. Here's some top tips that I can give you um, in order to know where to start. So we talked about setting goals and we talked about building up gradually. Um, but you need to find out what works for you. So what works for me, for example, personally, might not work for uh, Louise or might not work for somebody else on this call. And I think that it's so important and it might take a little bit of trial and error, but don't just always, you know, you can look at people for inspiration, but don't, if someone says, oh, I think it'd be great for you to go start running. Okay, if that, you just hate running and you're never gonna like it, you know, give it a go because you, you might change your mind. But really, if that's not for you, try something else because you're more likely to stick at something that you actually enjoy. Um, Everything in life, I think, is so important to, you know, we need some spon um, spontaneous activity, but getting into a routine can be really important for motivation and structure. So scheduling and um, moving into your day is one thing we talk about in detail when we work with people individually around motivation. It's scheduling and creating a routine for yourself, because that is a way that you're more likely to, to keep, that, keep that routine in there. But also it takes that around 30 days to create a habit. So yes, it's very difficult in the first two weeks. But if you stick at that routine after 30 days, you won't be able to live without it. So if, for example, you set a goal of going for a 10 minute walk three times a week, you schedule that into your routine three times a week. So it pops up on a Google calendar at nine o'clock in the morning. I'm going to go for a walk. You get yourself out. The likelihood is that the first you know, two weeks, it's really, really difficult. But then come after 30 days, you won't feel right if you don't go for that 10 minute walk three times a week. So um, that's all really important around scheduling and creating routine. One of the most important, important things is to make sure you relax and recover. So 
So listening to your body is really, really important. And you guys will know your body um, pretty well. I think I learned, you know, I, I feel like I know my body more than I ever have done after having cancer. And yes, there might be some things that I, you know, don't, you don't, don't necessarily really understand or might ignore, but actually my body can tell me when it's exhausted or it's tired and actually just needs the rest. So listening to your body is really, really important. And also remembering that Cancer-related fatigue can be a really, you know, it's a very, very common long-term side effects of treatment and exercise is absolutely um, the, the best intervention, intervention for that. So I, um, I think before, I was just going to say, Louise and Joe, before we go on to the actual, um, what you can get involved in, I didn't know whether anybody actually wanted to act, um, ask any questions around the evidence and what I've just talked about. Um, yeah, yeah, what do you think? It might just be a nice place to stop and then I'm going to go into the support services that you guys can um, look at. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I know in the, the bite size research, we ask people to write their questions in the chat function, but we're not as big a group. So if people do have anything they would like to share or, or sort yeah. of. Yeah, or any observations or. Yeah. I'd like, I'd like to say that. Um... My son, who had a diagnosis of Ewing's, was very active um, before his diagnosis. He played rugby at a high level and boxed. And it was he found it very, very debilitating, especially psychologically, to be unable to do those activities yeah. after diagnosis. It, it really knocked him out quite a lot. And um, what... What we found is, I, I also have a, a history of 10 years working in uh, mental health and um, I've treated or helped care for people post-treatment um, who um, prob uh, so anxiety, depression and PTSD were common symptoms. But another one of the major symptoms was um, caused by the uh, sort of the siege mentality that you can develop after the diagnosis, because of the the sense of isolation on occasion that that that's often present. And uh, to pick on your points about walking and and so on, I don't know if you're going to come on to this, but my son got great support from his friends who would come around when he was able and go for walks with him. Yeah. And, and, and just those short walks, sometimes he could only manage 100 metres, but those short walks weren't only about the exercise. They were about normalisation of his life and the reintroduction of his friends into his life and, and, and him still, still feeling part of a group still yeah. part of society his society as he knew it as a teenager yeah and thank you for sharing that phil and i think that i and I'm welcome on that with one of our initiatives but we have um like you say it's that normality and i think a lot of people like your son you were saying how he found it really really hard to not be able to do the things he used to do and and yeah. this isn't yeah. easy to get your head around but it's kind of we, we all have to, and people need to do it in everyday life, is to focus on today. So not what you should be doing or not what you should have been doing. It's like, where am I am right now? And if I become self-aware of where I am right now and what I can do right now, and you know, giving yourself the headspace to just think like that, hopefully it helps people to say, so your son to be able to go out for a walk with his friends, that mm -hmm. get him to forget about what he perhaps um, did before he was diagnosed with cancer. And we had one of our support groups. Um, so we have a 5K away uh, move against cancer group in Nottingham. And we have a lady um, in her 70s there and she's um, going through cancer treatment and um, doesn't know, you know, doesn't know what um, the future holds. But she said she loves coming down to the groups because she just talks about her running. So she didn't, she never ran before and she's now doing a 5K in under 40 minutes. And she said if she, if she um, did the 5K under 40 minutes for the first time, she jumped naked into a into a little stream by her house, and she did that. She stayed true to her word, but she wasn't a runner. But she said, "I come down to this group, and I don't talk about my cancer. I talk about 
the fact that I'm running 5k and I never ran before in my life and you know it's those stories that you hear and you're like mm -hmm. yeah they they do provide when you can get out with friends and and or people that you may don't know but then become friends it's really really important yeah excellent we 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 found that we found in mental health and, and also through our own experiences that everything all this is subjective isn't it it's all at a subjective level um as an example i would have to walk my son in a wheelchair but at some stage during the walk he'd asked me to stop and stand and then walk for as far as he could and if it was 100 meters maybe and he had to get back in a wheelchair that would possibly be demoralizing for him i would see his head go down a little bit but other times he'd get out of the wheelchair and he'd walk up the hedgerow in leeds and then back as far as he could and do a mile and the difference that made to him psychologically, the lift he gained from achieving that was, it was absolutely immense. And it was so, so important for his morale and, and, and self well being whilst he was undergoing treatment on the, on, on the ward. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that as well. Mm. Real. So, uh, has anybody else got any questions or shall we move on to the support group? Or I only have one if, if we've got time. Um, yep. So, uh, I mean, this is such a nice talk, Gemma. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and I, I just I actually wanted to build on Phil's point about the mental health aspect. And, and I think for so many people living with cancer, we know so much about anxiety and depression being so much higher. And even when those physical barriers maybe aren't there anymore, or they're getting a bit more manageable, how much of a role that kind of cycle of, you know, exercise can really help with mental health, but if you're not exercising, you're not getting that boost. And, and, and in your experience, how much of an impact that has and how have you found a way to kind of get over the, you know, kind of get into it, does that make sense? Yeah, so, so I think getting into, it, getting into exercise, do you mean, initially, yeah. yeah. It, uh, yeah. And it, it is really tricky and it takes, you know, everybody has different reasons for wanting to do it and different, you know, struggles that they might be facing, whether that be physical or psychological. Everybody's lifestyle is very different. So some people have more support and um, have people around them that are, you know, know the benefits of exercise and, do, you know, are more likely to take part in exercise. So you feel maybe more um, supported in that way. Um, but I think, for me, it's, it's understanding, there's three steps to it. First of all, it's understanding the why. So why is exercise important when living with, with and beyond cancer? The more you can understand that, the bigger the, your buy-in will be. So we know that serotonin levels increase, which are your happy hormones, when you move more. So it's not just, not just a saying, oh, it's good for you. It has true scientific benefits, whether that's living with or beyond cancer or just the general population. Um, it has true scientific benefits around those hormones. So, um, so if you understand the why, you're more likely to, to think about taking that first step. Now, taking the first step is, is difficult and that's where support is really needed. So the, the hardest thing for people living with, um, living with and beyond cancer is that we need it to start in the hospital setting and that often does not, doesn't happen. And it, and it can happen if people have consultants and um, healthcare professionals around them that have positive experiences with exercise themselves. So I work with a lot of healthcare professionals who talk about it and ask people what their exercise levels are or, you know, just bring it as part of a natural conversation. I also know a lot of health professionals that will never mention it, don't necessarily think it's part of their role to mention it. And there's a lot more education around this from a healthcare professional point of view then and as well and we're you know it's getting better but we need it to get better because they technically have the teachable moment so you go into hospital for your appointments or your follow-up appointments and if it was mentioned quite a lot you'd probably start something in your head would tick and go actually this exercise thing is probably quite important um so there's that there's that side of things as well um again the same with people get you know some people get a lot of um, physio support which is amazing but this is why there's a little bit of a gap between some people finish the treatment and then just get left. Other people get physio point, um, support during their treatment and also afterwards and get that support and often get back on their feet a little bit quicker. Um, so 
taking the first step is difficult. It comes down to individuals' motivations, their understanding, helping them provide support to take the first step and also doing presentations like this to hopefully inspire and motivate people to, to do that. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, and I always think it kind of comes back to what you were talking about. With, like if, if a doctor could prescribe it, I think having those conversations with a healthcare professional makes it feel like that's part of my treatment, that's part of my rehab. I think that's a really clever approach. Absolutely. And, and yeah. there's a, so there's a lot, um, there's a lot to do around that in terms of from charities and organizations point of view. So we had a, um, we had last night, um, a question and answer on our 5k away page with, um, Heli Anderson. So she's a, she's the founder of, um, active against cancer in Norway. So they have, um, fitness centers attached to hospitals and everybody, she, they're still having battles with healthcare professionals, but healthcare professionals will prescribe them to the fitness centers um, and people will go and do prehabilitation as well as um, um, exercise during their treatment and beyond. So we're a little bit behind on that. Um, there's still so much work to do from our point of view. Um, there's not a centralized approach through cancer care pathways yet. And I think it might be a while until that happens, but if we can all use the same voice and try and push towards that, we're getting better. The fact that I'm sat talking to you guys um, means that there's a big step forward around it. Um, so yeah, Brill, well, what we'll do is, um, thank you for those questions and it's really great. I love hearing different people's insights as well and their personal experience because I think everybody is really different and the more we can share our stories to inspire each other, the better. And that's what we're trying to do as a charity. You know, it's great having us from a clinical point of view, being able to share the evidence, but sometimes it really is the, you know, your experience and what you've had struggles with or what you've had a really positive experiences with as well, that really help to inspire other people in similar situations to you. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just for the last um, part of the presentation is actually give you um, an insight into what is out there um, for, for you guys to actually access support. And you're all, you'll all be extremely different. You'll all be in different places in your life. Um, so if there are any specific questions, I've said to Louise and Joe that you can contact me and I can help signpost um, in the right direction. So what are the things that you can get involved in? So as I mentioned, 5K Away Move Against Cancer. So that's an initiative that we set up. Um, we currently have, um, I think it's really quite we currently have 56 groups across the UK and Ireland. Obviously at the moment they're on hold um, because of COVID-19. However, we've putting some, we've had some virtual stuff that we've been doing. So um, I'll give you a little bit of insight into the virtual session. So on the last Saturday every month, I lead a move your way session so you can log on to our Facebook page. It's a functional movement exercise session um, that you can get involved in. And it's just basically moving on that last Saturday of every month on, um, you can do it in your house because obviously if people are shielding um, and that's a good way to get an introduction to exercise. We've got some of our groups doing, they did Land's End to John O'Groats virtually. So we're logging their walks or their runs, logging it within our community. And we've also started Round the World in 80 Days. Um, and they've covered 10,000 miles between them, <laughs> which is absolutely amazing. So I'll give you the link um, after this. Um, but we also do every single week, we do question and answers. Um, so on our website, you can actually look back at those question and answers. So for example, you've come on today to find out more information around cancer and exercise. We've basically been doing 12, 14 weeks of question and answers with experts um, in the area of cancer and exercise. So we've had doctors, consultants, doctors who have also had cancer themselves. Um, so from a patient and a healthcare professional um, experience, we've had people who are in our community sharing their stories around exercise and cancer. Um, so I would absolutely recommend going on and listening to those. Um, and we also have loads of community blogs as well that are on our website. So huge, a big, big resource now around exercise and cancer that you guys can access and look into. Do you see from the, oh yeah. yeah, so, yeah. Um, is there any way I can get involved? Cause I'm a personal trainer. Oh, brilliant. Um, and I, I emailed, um, Louise, um, a couple of emails yesterday um just about ways i can sort of help yeah so um yeah 
That'd be great. So what, what we'll do after this call is if you just want to um, Louise and liaise with Louise and you can connect with my email and we can take it offline and go from there in terms of um, what you would like to do. So I'm happy for my email to be passed on to you and we can to pick up that conversation. That's, yeah. That'd be great. Actually yeah. got um, a couple of busy days coming up, so probably next week sometime. Um, that works for me. <laughs> too. Yeah, no, that's absolutely great. Yeah. Um, as I said, um, you know, we, this initiative um, that we have, so you'll see the photo here is our Leicester 5K away group. Mm -hmm. So post COVID-19 or post when we're allowed to open up, this is what the group looks like. Um, so we have, you know, we have our ambassadors, which are wearing the hoodies, um, but we have over 160 volunteers who, who are basically our ambassadors who run these groups. And they just meet and greet people. Often our ambassadors are people affected by cancer. We have healthcare professionals as ambassadors. And really it's a support group with a difference, um, which is you know active people. It's within an existing community. So it's within a park run. Well, I'm actually based in Zurich. So it will be um, online sessions. I've left the, the other yeah. two know, so yeah. Well, we, yeah, and we can we can have an individual chat around there as well. So, um, yeah, that's great. So, this um, if we have a look, so some of our groups here, um, people affected by cancer, healthcare professionals, family members, friends, and it's really you know it's an amazing, amazing community. Um, so, what the you know what the aim of the community and the initiative is is to encourage those living with and beyond cancer, family, friends, and those working in cancer services to walk, jog, run, cheer, or volunteer at your local 5k awake group which is linked to a park run event on the last Saturday of every month. So what we what are we? So we're a sport a support group with a difference, a run and walking club with a difference, a social opportunity with a difference, and a coffee morning with a difference. And I founded it so it, it runs under Move Charity, but we founded it with um, Lucy Gossage who's a 12 times Ironman champion but also an oncologist consultant in Nottingham. So you can see this is our Nottingham group. Um, so people of all ages, all abilities, people walking with the tail walkers at the back, running and um, volunteering. Um, it's really a fantastic way to meet people who have been through similar situations to you, but often don't necessarily, you know, we're here to talk about cancer if you want to, but often people, you know, just go for their run or their walk and have other things and meet for the coffee afterwards as well. Um, so a really brilliant initiative to be part of. And you can see, so this one's our Solvent on Sea um, group, and that's their coffee morning afterwards. And, you know, I think we all wish that we could be back doing that, but we will be back doing that at some point um, when it is safe to do so. So I'm, so these are our websites. So we'll send them out to you, but www.movecharity.org, www.5kaway.org. Um, and actually our info at 5kaway.org um, if you need to get in touch with us there. So that's, that's kind of the work that we do. Now, some of you may or may not have seen this, but this is, um, so Safe Fit are, um, so the cancer rehab um, qualification that I have, I did it under a company called Can Rehab. That is run by a, um, Dr. Anna Campbell, who is an amazing lady. She's one of my mentors and she has 15 years of research, um, experience of research into the world and the space of cancer and exercise. So she's worked in Denmark with their cancer and exercise um, research and projects. And she's done the vast amount. She's wrote the Macmillan, um, all of the Macmillan information around cancer and exercise. So she's a brilliant, brilliant woman. Now SafeFit, they have launched a program called SafeFit, which is a remote service for anyone in the UK with suspicion or confirmed cancer diagnosis. So I don't know that whether this is specific for any of you guys or relevant, but at the moment you're able to get free, um, a free session with an exercise cancer rehab specialist and also access to resources for you to maintain and improve your physical and mental well-being. So the website address is at the bottom there. If you put in safe it into Google, it will come up with the right information. If you are a cancer rehab instructor, you can actually volunteer your time to be part of this. Um, so again, it's during the COVID-19 situation that we're going through at the moment. So it's virtual support, um, but it's a great, great platform. So not sure if everybody's, this is relevant to everybody, but absolutely have a look um, to see if you can access it. The other side of things is a company or a, um, another company organization called Moving Medicine, which bring in all of the specialist areas around cancer and exercise. So 
I sat in a room with 20 other cancer and um, excess specialist doctors consultants to um, help consult for a lot of these documents. So moving medicine, one part of their role is to try and encourage healthcare professionals to talk about exercise at, at consultation <coughs> appointments and, and those sort of things. So they provide guidance on how to have the conversation, but they also provide, sorry, they also provide leaflets, um, patient leaflets around what you can do to be active. So you can see some of these of why being active is important, top tips, how to build your activity into the day. Um, so they are the, you know, they're the three resources that I would recommend. There is quite a lot out there. Um, and I would say if you are really struggling that you probably do need support that's relevant to you um, in terms of if you have had surgery or you're struggling with a disability or um, anything like that, I would say that you might need a bit more specific support and guidance. Um, and I was saying to Louise earlier, we do work with as well private physios. You know, it can be very difficult to get support on the NHS. So we have links to private physios who used to be NHS physios who have now gone and set up their own practices and actually have experience in bone cancer and sarcoma. So, yeah, so that's where we are. So, yeah, I think that hopefully covers everything. Again, like I said, that was an overview and hopefully helped to inspire you to think a little bit more about exercise and movement. Um, and hopefully gave you a little bit of food for thought around how that could impact you and your lifestyle. So hopefully I haven't talked for too long <laughs> and hopefully you guys have got able to take something away or we can, you know, start new conversations and, and feedback for me is really, really important. Like what, like if you can, what did you find useful about our session? What would you like to know more of? Cause I'm sure we can do another session as well after this. So yeah, so I think hand back over to you guys. <laughs> Yeah, well, I've got to go now, but um, yeah, look forward to getting um, information about Gemma from Louise, yeah. Brilliant, Great. thank you. Okay, thank you. nice to meet everyone. See ya, bye. Bye, bye, bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Gemma. I've learned lots. <laughs> yeah, me too. That was great. It was really good. Did anyone yeah. have anything they wanted to ask or comment on? I really enjoyed the um, the, the presentation and what, what you had to say. Oh, I, thank um, you. The, 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 the one thing that struck me was, again, um, I, f I feel that there needs to be an emphasis on how subjective degrees of exercise are for different people. Yeah. You know, somebody could be running marathons such as yourself, be diagnosed with cancer, and then the next exercise they get is the ability to walk to the shops and back. Yeah. Well, that can be just as valid as running the marathon. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I agree. You know, it's... thank you. Um, no, I think as well, it's important to say that any sort of individualized cases of, or, you know, issues that you might be having, because I know people will have different experiences. Gemma, you know, and Joe and I are certainly happy to talk to you about it away from the group and the best ways to kind of help you move forward. Because yeah. um, I think what, what, I've always been like, I'm so passionate about the impact of cancer and ex um, exercise on people's lives and living with immune cancer. And what I want to make sure everyone has is the opportunity to get the support that they need. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, I'd love for there to be just a centralized system across the UK where everybody has a diagnosis, then you get an exercise program and then you can integrate it into your um, treatment program and it becomes the norm, but it still isn't the norm. So what we're trying to do is connect as it, we're a charity but we're trying to really even highlight other charities that are doing similar work to us so people have this um kind of resource and you can pick which one you want to get the support from and um, because i know that there just isn't you know it's really hard to find that support and information and we want to try and make it as easy to find as possible but that actually you get the support you need so you can live your best life rather than constantly struggling with that so the more we can do to help, the better, really. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm, I'm wondering now if... Um, I, I enjoyed your presentation. It's very accessible. It's very easy to understand. Um, it's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I know while we were on the wards, um, at all times, uh, we, we were always told there was an occupational therapist available. Um, to what degree do you think occupational therapists tie into your eth ethos of um, exercise? 
I are, think are, they, are they a valid resource in, in your, your point of view? From Ab absolutely. I think occupational uh, therapists and physiotherapists provide incredible, like occupational therapists around the movement and getting you to do functional movement and everyday tasks is extremely, extremely important. I think the issue is the consistency of access across the board. Um, yeah. That's what that's the issue. So some people have great support when they're in hospital around occupational therapists or going to see a physio. Um, but I'll just give you an example. I worked with a young guy who had sarcoma and he had a metal plate in his thigh, and he didn't. He was on a TYA ward and he didn't get. He got one appointment with a physio um, and some exercises, and that was pretty much it. Once he got discharged from hospital, so I actually worked on a one-to-one -one basis with him. And what I did was I, the first step was actually building the muscle around the area um, to be able to support. So looking at, you know, his bum, glute muscles, his hip, um, his quad, and actually looking at how we get him to even be able to functionally walk better. And, and now, you know, I worked with him for 12 weeks individually. We built up the strength first and then looked at the cardiovascular side of things but i you know i've had photos of him doing 12 mile tough mudders and he's able to run again and <laughs> hospital you know the hospital said he couldn't run again well, but it's not about him getting out of hospital and going going and doing that that took two or three years to get to but we built the foundations first and that muscle strength was so important um for his yeah. diagnosis and the surgery that he had um yeah. So, and that shows what happens when you, like he sought out that support and we weren't, you know, we're a charity associated with the hospital, but we weren't a hospital service. So, um, yeah, so there's different variants of support in there. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I still, still think, um, I like to emphasize, emphasize from a mental health point of view, the, the idea of um, exercise has been a starting point um yeah to reintegrating people back into society because you are excluded you are excluded from society for whatever length of time your care is you know you're isolated against viruses and you know god knows what infections and you, yeah. you and, and quite often um in, in a mental health setting quite often we had carers who were um having more problems than the people had been caring for psychologically you know and, and um i think exercise has that ability to draw people into a, into a group setting which again to use that word normalization yeah and that's why we so with our five play away groups we really really encourage healthcare professionals to come down because not only do they you know they have a positive experience with exercise and it gets them moving, which is, you know, there's a lot of healthcare professionals that probably aren't moving enough out there, but it gets them to see the normality that somebody yeah. living with and beyond cancer can have and integrate into that setting that is away from cancer in the hospitals. And I think that's really, really important. Um, yeah, and, and you have to learn how to have normal conversations with people again. Yeah, definitely. You know. Yeah, yeah, really, yeah, really great to hear that insight as well. Fab. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any more questions, anybody? Is there anything else you'd like to speak to Gemma about? Hi, Gemma. I've got a quick question. Yeah. Sorry, I know I know we're running out of time. Hello, Hi. <laughs> Hi, Samantha. <laughs> Hi. Um, my son was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma at the age of twelve. Yeah. Um, he's now fifteen, and he's living with possibly a lifelong disability. Yeah. Um, he was really sporty. Um, motivation for exercise before cancer was not an issue at all. Um, but now he can't walk without a crutch. He can't run. He can't ride a bike. Um, and yeah. I know you say you shouldn't focus on the things that you could do before, but there's oh, yeah. very little that he can do now yeah. as, a com as a competitive sport with his friends. And yeah. that is really hard. Mm. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know what you suggest. I have tried what I think is everything. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for sharing that, Sam. And I think that is the, it's really, really difficult, isn't it? When you see, especially when you're supporting somebody, um, especially your son through that and that, you know, for a young person of that age, there's nothing to deny that that is extremely difficult. 
One thing I would say is, um, so I mentioned it um, before, we have our online cancer rehab support program for children and young people, and our cancer rehab instructor, Helen, is amazing. Um, and so sometimes actually getting some external support outside that family support can be extremely important. And we've worked with a lot of young people. Um, it's not just working the physical side of things, it is as well to try and build that strength and physical ability but it's also the mental side of things and so I would actually recommend potentially referring into our um, online cancer rehab service um, because he's in the right age to do so um, but it you know we can then have a more of a detailed chat around the situation what the barriers are what he might be struggling with what you guys might be struggling with as well um, and talk into that in a little bit more detail would that be something that you might be interested in looking at yeah, that sounds really helpful. I know I did get in touch with you um, when he was going through treatment, and okay. I, did speak to, I did speak to you back then. Um, oh, he I was think in a wheelchair at the you, time. Sam. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because so, our, our programs evolved quite a lot quite, since then, so I think it would be really worth getting like going through that program actually. Okay, I think he would really benefit from some kind of mentor or somebody who he can connect with because he's 15 now and, and nothing I can say is going to encourage him to do exercise. Yeah. <laughs> but if there's somebody that he could, you know, motivate him, I think, um, yeah. a little bit. Yeah, well, let's, um, so, because we, so we do a self-referral on our website. So if you go into the Move Charity website and I'll flag that when it comes in. And Helen Marie, our cancer rehab instructor. So you might want to go on to, so our 5K Away website, we actually did a question and answer with two young people and Helen. Um, and it was really amazing to hear the positive impact the program had on them, but also to hear their struggles and their stories. Um, so that might be also something of going, actually there are other young people out there who are also struggling, but actually have had some mentoring and support. Um, and I know, I think Sam, when we first spoke, I don't think our, we weren't fully up and running with that online cancer no. rehab service. And we are a lot more streamlined now. <laughs> I mean, we look like a big charity, but that's pretty much only me. <laughs> um, so, so I think, I, think, was, I think you're doing really well. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard at times, but we're trying. Um, but I think that would be a really good step. Um, so if you want to do that, uh, um, I can definitely flag that with Helen once it's referred and we can get, um, get that work started. Excellent. Thank you so much. Real. Thanks, Sam. Um, is there anything else or can we guys? And if you do have any thoughts or feelings or feedback or areas that you think that we, you might have wanted to hear more of or that you found useful or didn't find useful, let the guys know because um, Louise and the team know because um, we can come back on and do a, a carry on presentation um, on a, some more specific areas maybe as well. So yeah. And yeah. Gemma, if you could let us have the links that you've highlighted in your yeah. talk and we can forward them on to people. Yeah. Um, that'd be great. I would do that. No problem. <laughs> okay. Well, I uh, just want to say thank you very much, Gemma. That was absolutely brilliant, really informative. I um, hope you all enjoyed it. And yes. uh, we'll thank send you. out um, the links for, that we get from Gemma um, so you can take things forward if, if you want to. And thank you for having me, guys. I really, really appreciate it. Um, coming oh, on here to chat to you. It's actually thank lovely you. to see all your faces as well, that I get to see them when I talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. I just wanted to mention as well, um, our next sort of webinar series is going to be on late effects from cancer treatment. And it's going to be given by the two founders of the late effects clinic in Nottingham. And that's going to be on the 30th of July, which is also a Thursday from 1 until 2 p.m. So we will send out more information about it um, in sort of the, the days and weeks to come. But yeah, it should be a good one as well. So we hope you can join us. What, what was that in? To Louise, the late effects, are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, so um, it's basically, it's a clinic that was started in Nottingham um, by two radiographers who identified the late effects from cancer treatment having a substantial impact on people's lives well beyond, you know, coming out of treatment. Mm -hmm. So you can actually self-refer to this clinic up to, I think it's after six months of being out of treatment um, and it's all pretty self-contained. So they can help with, 
a lot of issues under one place. They don't have to refer you necessarily to another department. They've had a lot of training in lots of different areas. I won't say too much, but yeah, it's, um, it's an amazing service. And it's not actually in that many places in the UK. I think there's five, is there, Joe? Yeah, that's country. right. There's only five across the country. Uh, they're, hoping, they're hoping to roll out more, but again, it's dependent on funding, etc. cetera. So. Yeah. Isn't it amazing and wonderful how there's these little groups yeah. Here and there that you, you don't hear of, but they're there fighting. Absolutely. I know, yeah. So that's, that's what we were speak. talking about before, before we started. We're saying all, all these wonderful services that should be available to everybody yeah. everywhere, but it isn't. So, but anyway, yeah. hopefully we can bring it to, to you. So, yeah. this is go. a wonderful support group as well, by the way. It's, um, it's really nice to come on and see what you guys have been doing. And the fact that you can see everyone's faces, it's just so nice that you can still connect virtually it's yeah brilliant so well done guys for setting this up as well oh, oh we you. love it we absolutely yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much thank you guys thank you bye everybody thank you, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.